Good evening all, I'm Aditi Lamba with the Thursday night edition of South Asian News. Welcome to Vision of Asia, Voice of the Community. We are coming to you from our studio in New York City. Here's what's happening tonight in the coronavirus pandemic. Globally, we are looking at more than 979,000 deaths related to the novel virus and 32 million cases. The United States has surpassed a sobering number of 200,000 deaths with at least 6.97 million COVID-19 cases. Today, top health official Dr. Anthony Fauci reminded all that there is a good enough data to say that aerosol transmission does occur, which means wear the mask. And CDC Director Dr. Redfield has said that half of the U.S. states, U.S. heartlands and the Midwest are reporting a rise in new COVID-19 cases and said that 90% of the population is susceptible to the novel virus. On vaccine, Johnson & Johnson announced its one-dose vaccine has entered phase three of its trial. On economy, another 870,000 Americans filed for unemployment benefits. The recovery of the economy from the pandemic is very slow. This is happening while racial strife continues in the nation with protesters who took to the street yesterday in several U.S. cities, including Louisville, Atlanta, New York City, Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia in response to the verdict of Breonna Taylor's death, which included only one of the three officers indicted and the other two not indicted, with no officer charged with Taylor's death directly. Civil rights activists decried over the outcome as miscarriage of justice in keeping with the nationwide pattern of unwarranted police violence against minorities. Louisville tonight is bracing for a second night of protests after two officers were shot during demonstrations last night. There's a lot of unrest in the nation with demands for racial and social justice, so we hope that the protesters continue to demonstrate in a peaceful, non-violent manner and take all necessary precautions as we are still in a pandemic don't forget to wear a mask. And mourners continue to pay respects to Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg as she lies in repose at the Supreme Court as the nation honored her legacy. Today saw President Trump, accompanied by First Lady Melania Trump, visiting the casket of Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg. Much is happening all across, so let's begin the South Asian news segment, bringing much insight into COVID-19 impact and elections 2020. Here are the headlines. Akshay Patra raises $500,000 at Families for Change Virtual Gala featuring actress Ravina Tundan, Florida. Designer duo Dave and Neil on fashion industry during pandemic, Devar Neil, Kolkata, India. Mayor Sadaf Jafar discusses upcoming November elections 2020, Montgomery Township, New Jersey. A lot more on the other side of the break. Stay with us on Vision of Asia, Voice of the Community. We'll be back shortly. And welcome back, I'm Aditi Lama and this is Vision of Asia Thursday night episode of South Asian News. Let's take a look now at the nonprofit world with our focus on Akshay Patra Foundation. Established in 2000, the foundation is one of the largest NGO school meal programs in the world, enabling more than 1.8 million children across India. The foundation prides itself in providing education through food, tackling the issue of childhood hunger in India, and currently has diverted its focus on COVID-19 relief efforts as South Asia grapples with the pandemic. Recently, the Florida chapters of Akshay Patra Foundation held a virtual gala, Families for Change raising $500,000 for its COVID relief programs for migrant workers and educational supplies to its midday meal beneficiaries, as well as support midday meals for two children when the schools do open. The event saw supporters, philanthropic leaders, donors and volunteers of the foundation come together virtually and featured Indian actress Ravina Tandon who shared her experience with philanthropy. Here is a segment of the gala featuring actress Ravina Tandon on Akshay Patra. So I would like to have everybody say just a couple of sentences on what, what the theme means to you, families for change. Yeah, I think uh, when you say families for change, I think there is kind of a, I see like a, a, a dual side to this. So on one side, you know, we we had and even in our family, uh, you know, our daughters getting involved. Uh, you know, she started inviting her friends. And then when I look at the other side of it, you know, when we are uplifting these students, the whole family is getting uplifted. So it's families on both sides that are pushing the ball and then so, you know, the ball basically uplifts the families on the other side. So it's a very nice sort of a joint team effort on uh, both sides to kind of drive India forward. Thank you. Uh, Kavita? I have seen 
kids uh, uh, while I was doing the campaign, the parents were involved, but when they informed the kids that this is what the Akshay Patra is about, they jumped into the program. They were so excited. And the other one calls yesterday, Auntie, I went around in my house and then I got some uh, flyers and then I got some money. A couple of people donated too. So seeing that it has an effect on the parents too. So from the beneficiary side and like when the kids are involved and you see the parents so happy that the kids are being fed and studying. Sheila, what are your thoughts on families for change? One family at a time, we are conveying the awareness of Akshay Patra. So, so it's like one family here and one family there and slowly it becomes two and four and six and eight and ten. And that's one thing I feel. And then the other thing is that this, this um, we, all, we all know that, you know, it's the, the, the giver actually has a greater amount of joy than sometimes the receiving person. Um, they may not even know who we are, that person who's receiving it. But then we know that we are doing our part. So the way I look at it is what um, Sheila just said, family at a time, that's so true. But at the same time, when we as individuals who we all have families are getting exposed to Akshay Patra and indirectly exposing our children to it, and then watching our children go out and talk to their friends to grow this population is so feels so warm that you know the kids are also understanding that this is very important it's their counterpart in India who also need to have a future they very much realize that we have a good future because we were born in a particular family but that does not mean that we ignore the kids in India who didn't get the same opportunity families are connecting with families in India and uh, I think uh, during COVID it's becoming a lot more apparent that it's not just the child educating the child and taking care of the child's family and them being able to be uh, skilled and educated above us the next generation that you develop but it's the current generation that needs our help right now and i'm going to turn to venkat and uh, venkat tell us about your experience with akshay patra from a newcomer's uh, perspective i myself basically i went to uh, the Jappi PHI school. So there, uh, on a daily basis uh, during school days, I do see uh, kids getting uh, basically you know, midday meal pro uh, meals. So once I heard about how Akshay Patra came from 1500 meals to 1.8 million, uh, in 1.8 million kids per day, that's really touching and uh, motivating. Uh, definitely coming to the goal of going from 1.8 million to 5 million meals per day, uh, really, I would like to see that day come very soon. So we had a, we had a, we were reading a book with my four-year-old, and um, so we were looking at all the things that that are you know us. And I asked her, "What is your superpower?" And she said, "You know, I my superpower without blinking." The first time I asked her when she was three, she said, "My superpower is Baba, her dad." And then uh, one year again later, I asked her, "What's your superpower?" And she says. It, I like making fee people food feel good about themselves, and so uh, sweet. And it's true. I mean, she has a maturity that is beyond her. But I think we all do have our superpowers. We secretly know that. And uh, what is Ravina's superpower? I can say that uh, being a woman for me is 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 being a superpower in its own, because I do believe that. Uh, and yes, I'm not answering you like because it's a you know question that oh my god it's gonna. Uh, I, I hope it does inspire people, but I strongly believe in it because I do believe women uh, have been built uh, emotionally uh, and and within themselves a, a an, an inherent power uh, that they have. Uh, I think that's the reason why gave uh, you know God gave them the shakti to reproduce and to recreate because they bring into this world a life, the female power. And uh, maybe men couldn't have handled the pain. <laughs> you know, even my husband wonders, like, you know, how do you guys do it? Um, so I think that's why God gave us that strength uh, to, uh, to, to procreate, to, to, to bring a life into this world. And I think that is one of the biggest gifts that we have. 
and i i believe every woman i mean even in uh, uh, you know in in i i just take an example of a city like mumbai you see the women how they work they 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 actually they are like babies multitasking with uh, you know probably thousand arms whether they're looking after children they're cooking their food they're doing their office work they're going to the office early in the morning ironing their children's clothes washing their clothes or uh, setting up their dabba setting up their husband's dabbas for office and then leaving themselves for work and when they come back from their office that home routine starts all over again helping the children with you know cooking the food helping children with homework then doing their own office work then again washing the clothes then again i mean it's a full days process i mean where does that power come from so i thank god that i'm a wo- woman because i do believe that that inner shakti that he's given me to be able to uh, you know uh, uh, surface or or rise again from any kind of issues or any kind of problems that is thrown to me and the fact that we can swing it and we can do it really well is in a way a blessing and 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 a superpower on its own the fashion industry is proving to be one of the hardest hit as a result of the coronavirus pandemic with millions of jobs lost in the garment factories of asia and thousands of companies facing a fight to stay afloat here in the west There has been a fundamental shift in the fashion sector to a slower pace due to the economic ramifications of the novel virus impacting nations globally. From manufacturers to consumers, there has been a shift in quantity and delivery along with e-commerce taking the front stage to keep businesses running. Support from governments to furloughing employees have all become a part of survival for the fashion industry especially in South Asia. There is hope to bounce back in the fall with many nations reopening but many still concerned as cases surge in countries such as India. So what is the current condition of Indian fashion and how are designers coping up with the pandemic to stay working with all safety measures? We spoke with Indian fashion designer duo Dave and Neil, the creators of the label Dave R Neil, a contemporary Indian fashion brand rooted in Indian textiles and heritage. Neil and they provide us a very real picture of the fashion industry in 2020. Here is a segment of the conversation. You know, for our audience that may not know about your amazing label and all of the amazing work that you guys do, could you give us a brief insight into what Devar Neil is and, you know, what is a Devar Neil girl or a woman? So, quickly as a brief run through, uh, we we have just hit our 16th year of wow. the brand and uh, uh, I, I I studied fashion in Australia and they've studied here in India we I we came back and met here and started working together quite instantly so it's been uh, yeah 16 years and devarnil woman is for us devarnil woman is always evolving evolving yeah. and uh, once we take you uh, through a run through of what we do then you will realize what kind of looks we do um maybe you have seen all the bollywood stars who have worn it so worn us so yeah yes. i mean a wo- a woman is actually from a little tiny toddler to uh, a granny you know and that's the range that we cover and uh, so yeah yes for sure you know before we go more into what is happening in your latest collection and what the store offers i kind of want to have a conversation about the fashion industry with you as a whole you know with the impact of covid-19 on so many industries fashion industry has definitely been hit as well you know um, i would love to know how you have changed your programs or transformed functionings of your store as well as manufacturing due to covid-19 how has that experience been for the two of you so um obviously covid has hit the textile industry quite badly because um uh, anything to do with clothing is almost like occasion wear right like like people primarily shop for some sort of events festivals and occasions which all got wiped out in the last 6 7 months and slowly the festive season is coming so that's why slowly clients are walking in they're coming into shop so but when in a business you have a gap of almost 6 months yeah. and uh, where you are generating employment for close to 80 to 100 people uh, that's under our label mm. uh that becomes a big big task for the sense of survival you know you can go on supporting for so long so long but um i have to tell you this that 
in India, we tried to work out with the textile ministry, finances and everything. We mobilized the whole movement. But finally, unlike other places around the world, whether it's UK or US, mm. you didn't get direct um, government support. And so we had to make our own ways to support our workers and our own businesses. So that that's a tough task. And uh, what has happened out of all of this is the moment in June, the lockdown starts loosening up, we immediately started our operations. Right now we are working with 30% of our team. Yeah, it's a very small team oh, with, wow. uh, with yeah. you know, the people that, that are required to finish a garment from start to finish. And uh, very, very limited, tight uh, group of people. Uh, yeah, basically you're trying to maintain all the protocol, right? The, yeah. If you call everybody in at this point of time who travels from far off places, then you have to really you know, um, increase the risk. At, at the end of the day, it increases the risk of transmission and stuff. So yes. until all the public transports and everything is restored, we are not able to get back into the full uh, fledged production. Yeah. But yet we are still somehow uh, the, the production is on and you have to do all the protocols of, you know, whether it's masks, whether it's sanitization, mm. uh, whether it's quarantining people who are coming from far off places, things like that. So what's happening with the, um, you know, the other employees of your, of your company, you know, the ones that are not uh, coming to work, have they been assisted by the government? Are you helping them? Um, you know, this has taken a huge, uh, massive hit on the industry, um, pretty magnanimous. Yeah, so um, the, most of the other workers are also part of the ESI, the Employment Service Scheme of which is uh, maintained by the government. So they do get a dole out from there from time to time and they can take loans based on the deposits we have made now. So mm. uh, made in the past. So they are able to survive, but I will tell you the truth, it's not very easy surviving because obviously the government is giving out some amount of grains and food. Yeah, there's, they're, they're being supported in a small way. Very small. Uh, but also some of them that I speak with, uh, who do not want to come back right now no. in the clothing business, uh, in the clothing industry. Rather, they would, they're focusing on things that are giving them instant money. For mm -hmm. example, some of them are doing businesses of vegetables, farming, farming, you know, and uh, other they want like, to stay in their villages. So large part of our laborers or our workers, they all come from different villages mm. around uh, the city of Kolkata. So they are still sticking around at their um, hometowns, which is actually okay. That's the primary choice they have made because right. trains and local trains and other transports have not started. Oh, wow. So I think we're all balancing in between all of these. You know, yeah. we're trying to see whether the numbers will go down, whether we will have a second wave. Because in India, it's only one wave. It's you a know? big yeah. tsunami. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. There is no second wave. It's going to be one wave which will which we are being hit with, so yeah. It's time for another short break. Stay with us on Vision of Asia, Voice of the Community. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back. This is Vision of Asia, the South Asian news segment, and I am Aditi Lamba. United States presidential and congressional elections, which are much awaited, take place on November 3rd, and we would like to remind all citizens to make sure and register to vote. Make sure you get your voice heard this year. Court battles over how votes are going to be tallied has spread all across amidst this pandemic in every competitive or swing state. With speculation swirling over his pick for the Supreme Court, President Trump headed to Florida today hoping to shore up support in the state. This battle over the Supreme Court continues to truly shape the 2020 race. Democratic nominee Joe Biden's campaign today held a press call over protecting the Affordable Care Act in light of the Supreme Court and also said that former Vice President will commit to a peaceful transfer of power as a response to President Trump's unwillingness to commit a peaceful transfer of power. So how do all these issues impact the South Asian American voice? And what's crucial in these elections? We spoke with Mayor Sadaf Jaffer of the Montgomery Township in New Jersey on her takes on election 2020 and the importance of voting. Here is Mayor Sadaf Jaffer, the first South Asian American Muslim mayor in New Jersey. 
Definitely. And, you know, just looking a little bit more into it and discussing a little bit more into the COVID-19 resources, if parents are watching you right now on ITV Gold and they're still confused about their children or, you know, people that are going to college, what do you say to them? I will say, you know, I understand the confusion. I don't have all the answers. I don't think that there's a magic bullet. I think that we as a society and each family needs to kind of gauge their comfort level with risk. But, you know, there's no such thing as being 100% protected if you're outside. COVID-19 doctors who are completed, completely suited up have gotten it. So we have to kind of think about our own comfort levels, our own, you know, what our bandwidth is, if we even have the ability to stay home as long as we can. Um, but these decisions are, are very difficult, but they should be driven by data and what the rates are. And we have to be comfortable with the fact that we might start reopening and then have to close things again if the numbers start going up again. Right. I was just about to get there. There is a huge fear um, of a second surge, which will impact the whole nation again. Um, you know, we were, the tri-state has been one of the mo worst hit, um, you know, states in terms of the, the death numbers we have seen. Um, is your township and the state of New Jersey ready for the second surge in terms of PPE supplies, in terms of hospital beds, ventilators, and the resources that, you know, a lot of the North states had to struggle with in the first surge? Right. Well, I think, as we were just talking about earlier, we didn't know what we were dealing with in the beginning. And we were not given guidance from the federal government saying, you know what, this is going to be bad. You need to shut down. You need to do this. Um, so that lag time in closing things down led to the huge surge that we had before. This time around, I think that we're being very cautious. We're watching the numbers really closely. Doctors and medical professionals have learned a lot more about the disease and how to treat it. Our contact tracing systems are in place. Um, so I think that we're as prepared as we can be. I mean, when it comes down to it at the end of the day, human beings are fragile. We are susceptible to disease and especially a disease like this, which is novel and new to us. Mm -hmm. So I think that we all need to do as much as we can. Government resources need to be marshaled to have flu cl clinics because we don't want two pandemics at the same time in terms of a flu and COVID. So get your flu shots, yes. um, be as healthy as possible, wear your mask, keep social distance. As much as you can avoid interaction with too many people, do avoid it. Um, and then we, we just have to make the best of it. It's, it's not an easy situation. There's no absolutely correct right or wrong answers, but we try to make the best decisions we can with the data that we have on hand. What's your focus for the next two months? My focus is just watching the numbers closely, continuing to advocate for all of these practices. I know people are tired. And as the numbers got lower, people start getting more comfortable, wanting to do get back to you know what life was before. But we're not there yet. We can't be there yet. We have to make those cultural changes. So you know, trying to reassure the community, trying to add a little bit of fun and socialization, but also within reason. Um, and and by also trying to build a sense of community, whether it is through Zoom events, that's really what I've been trying to do for my community is bring people together through Zoom events, mm -hmm. try to have mayor's videos where people will get a sense of who I am as their township leadership. Um, but really, honestly, for the next two months, my, my focus is trying to get people to get out to vote mm -hmm. and um, you know, make their voices heard in the electoral system. And this wraps up our show for the night. Remember to send us your suggestions and get your voices and organizations on our show. Email us on events at itvgold.com or follow us on Facebook at itvgold. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch many of our popular shows for free. Thank you for joining us from Queens, New York. This is Vision of Asia and I am Aditi Lamba. Take care and be well.